couple things before we jump into the Word of God uh, today is I want to let you know uh, that in your seat is a little uh, card. On that card it says open house. I want you to get that out and just kind of put it in your hands. Uh, everybody doing this. Um, I want to encourage you uh, to jump in and get connected to Rescue House. Maybe you've been at the revival nights. Maybe you've been here uh, for a couple months. I, I want you to know like what Dan spoke of our church. Like we're, we're pumped about your jump to uh, kind of get to the house, uh, cross from death to life, place your faith in Jesus. But we are committed to your journey. And one of the ways we're able to commit at a high level to your journey is by you taking your next step and connecting with our house. If you just stay in a row, I'm telling you, you're not going to grow. But when you get uh, around some people who uh, are all about this vision, man, it becomes contagious. And we want you to connect with this family. That's what we are at Rescue House. That's why we kind of have the house tag in our church name, because in a house is a family and we're a family. And, and you become part of the family when you get connected, uh, specifically through serving. And so, so next week, uh, we're going to have what we call open house immediately following the experience. We're going to have food for you. We're going to have child care for you. And this is for anybody who says, man, I don't want to just sit in a row anymore. Like I'm ready to, you know, I know this church isn't about me. It's about serving. It's about becoming a part of the family. And so I want to encourage you uh, to go ahead and sign up for that. So on that card, just go ahead and sign that card. If you're looking for a place to like plug in, connect, uh, sign that card. And when you go out into the atrium after after this experience, there's a, a station with balloons. Just look for the red and white balloons, and you just turn it in there. Listen to me. You signing this card, and you're just committing to being at open house. You're not committing to serving anywhere. You're not committing to connecting anywhere. You're just saying, hey, I want to come hear what uh, they have to say about this church. I want to get to know this church, and we're going to share with you where you can plug in. And I just believe that at the end of it, you're, you're going to want to be a part of all that God is doing here. So I want you right now, if you know that, man, that's my next step. I need to just come see what this church is about. I need to see where my next step is in connecting with this house. Would you just go ahead and fill that out and, and then just hold on to it and immediately afterwards you can turn that in. Again, we're going to have food for you. We'll take care of lunch for you and we'll have child care so don't worry about that. And then also next week we start a brand new series called Relationship Goals and I'm just excited about this. This is for you know that couple that looks at you know uh, a godly couple and you say man like that's relationship goals right there or you see a friendship that takes place and you're like, man, I wish I could become a better friend. I wish I could become a better parent. I wish that I could uh, be transformed in that way. We're going to be talking about all kinds of relationships, whether you're single, you're dating, you're engaged, you're married, uh, or you just have no uh, desire for a romantic relationship, but you desire friendship. Um, we're going to talk about all kinds of relationships in this six-week series, and I just want to encourage you to get here because we were not meant to do life alone. Amen? We were, a, we were meant to have a shared relationship uh, with Jesus, a personal relationship and then a shared one because it was not meant for us to do life alone. We're better together. Amen? Clap your hands if you believe that. We're better together. Come on, we're a family. And today's National Back to Church Sunday, so if you're back in a while or this is your first time, we're honored you're here. Uh, we want to encourage you just to keep coming back, keep sitting under the Word of God and uh, connect with our family. Everybody in life at some point has had a life-altering moment. Some of you had it this week at Revival. I'll never forget uh, going to the Dixie Classic Fair for one of the first times and eating that Krispy Kreme cheeseburger. It'll change your life. Anybody? I told you, I love the Dixie Classic Fair. I'm just kidding about that, though. Uh, I'm talking about real life-altering moments, like the, the day that I married Lauren. That was just huge. That was unbelievable. Have I ever told you about our first kiss as a married couple? Her nose was running like a faucet and like I went in and I was like okay like I'm gonna do this life-altering moment for me um, I'll never forget the day that God called me to start this church I'll never forget the day that my kids were born Shapiro and Miller these were life-altering moments but the there was a moment in my life that I didn't see coming and it was the day that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. It was November 20th, 1994. And I didn't walk into church that day thinking my life was going to be changed. I didn't walk into church that day thinking I'm going to have a life-altering moment. And it's because most life-altering you know, moments, some of them come in a time where you least expect it. Like, I wonder if you came in here today going, man, my life's going to change. 
My life is going to alter today. Man, there's an adjustment that's going to be made today. I believe God's not finished making adjustments with us. But I'm, I'm telling you, you we've, that's why we've always got to remember or, or be aware of what God wants to do right now. See, we're all like, when, we, when I get my mess cleaned up, maybe God will do something. Or when I kind of figure this situation or circumstance out, when I get through this, on the other side of this is when God wants to do something. And like, man, maybe God wants to do something in you, through you, and to you right now. Amen? Like, I'm looking for people who say, I'm about the now. I'm about the moment. Yes, I have vision and I want to look to the future. But I, I want to be obedient to what God is speaking to me right now. And if there's one thing I know about Rescue House Church, I just want to speak this over you, is God has called you uniquely to make a difference in our community, in our state, and in our world. You were created on purpose, for a purpose, with a purpose, and that main purpose is for you to take your passion and use it to make a difference and, and, and make your life count for what matters most, and that's the glory of Jesus Christ. And that starts when you have a moment where you say yes to Jesus and yes to the God who is speaking to you right now, and I promise you it will change your life. It all goes back to that moment when you say yes to God in a life-altering moment where he's asking you to do something and step out on faith. The message title of this sermon today, I want you to write this down. I'm not going to have it on the screen. Is B-Y-S-S-I-W. Go ahead and write that down. B-Y-S-S-I-W. B-Y-S-S-I-W. W. Can you say it with me? B-Y-S-S-I-W. One more time. B-Y-S-S-I-W. And I believe if you will embrace this message today, it's going to be life-giving and life-changing. Anybody ready for the Word of God? Come on, you're not... Don't fade on me now. I need you to preach this with me this morning just like it's at nighttime, just like the revival nights. Today we're going to look at a little story in... Uh, Luke chapter 5. Well, who was here for Dan Leanne's talk? Yeah. Come on. Turn to your neighbor and say, give me five. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter 5. He was talking about Mark chapter 5, and we want to be a Mark chapter 5 church. But today we're going to be in Luke chapter 5, and we're going to look at this guy named Peter. Man, I love Peter. Out of all the biblical characters, I love Peter because Peter was a screw-up. Peter was... Uh, somebody who made a ton of mistakes, and I can relate to that. Anybody? Like, I'm just like, man, thank you, God, for Peter. But when you look at the, the life of Peter, I think I can make an argument that Peter was one of the top three Christians to ever walk the face of the earth. Not that Jesus is into ranking them, but I'm talking about a Christian who has influence, man. I believe he was in the top three most influential Christians on the planet. And what was it about Peter that made him so special? Was it uh, that he had the best education? No, he had the same education as everybody else that uh, grew up around him. Was it where he's from? No, he was from the middle of nowhere. Was it he was born into a rich family and was given things that other kids weren't given? No, actually he was born into a family business just like everybody else. None of that set Peter apart. So what was it that di differentiated Peter from everybody else? It was the fact that he had the boldness and the humility Humility to say yes to Jesus, even when it was uncomfortable, even when it was inconvenient, even when he didn't want to say yes to Jesus, he said yes to Jesus in a moment, and it changed his life. Now, Peter is this ordinary, average person, blue-collar worker, just like you and me. And we think about who Jesus sat around and who Jesus called as his disciples to be his team. And they were all just ordinary people. But can I show you what we see as ordinary blue-collar fishermen and carpenters and workers? But then, let me show you what Jesus saw when he sat down with his team. I thought this was a good picture. Somebody sent this to me. This is what Jesus saw. Isn't that good? Because what Jesus sees is not who you are. He sees the potential of all that you can be. And while everybody else saw the not good enoughs, the ordinary, God saw the extraordinary, and God saw superheroes. And one of those people was Peter. And what he saw in Peter was unbelievable. And yes, he had mistakes. And yes, he was going to continue to make mistakes. But God saw something in him. Jesus saw something in him 
saw the potential in him to be a difference maker. And so here, I just want to give you three things today, three quick things this morning that if you want to be a difference maker... Like, you want your life to count for what matters most, man. You don't want to get to the end of your life and look back and wonder, did I really make a difference? Because a lot of people, like, end up just working and trying to climb the corporate ladder, and I'm just trying to do all this, and then they get to the end of their life. You know, I've never heard somebody at the end of their life on their deathbed look back and just say, man, I wish I just would have worked more. (laughs) But I do hear people say, man, I wish that I would have served more. I wish that I would have made more of a difference. And you don't want to be that person, man. You want to be the person that is looking for every opportunity, every single morning, every single person, every single interaction. Man, I want to make a difference. And God has positioned me and poised me to be able to speak that difference, to be that difference, to be an example of what it's like to follow Jesus. So here we go. Write write these things down. I need you to be with me. Turn to your neighbor say, wake up. Go ahead and shout to them. Say, wake up. Come on. Let's go. Here we go. Number one, make room. you got to make room if you want to be a difference maker. Everybody in here probably could use a little extra room. Amen? Like, we like room. We like a little elbow room, right? Like, when we go to the movies, we want elbow room. Okay? We don't want somebody, like, all up on top of us, right? That's why when you go to the Grand now in Winston-Salem, which is where it's at, they've got recliners for you. Okay, because they understand you got to make some room. I'll never forget on our way to Israel, our family's pastor, we were all sitting uh, in this big long row of like five seats, and she was kind of not on the end. She was on the chair just inside of the end, and uh, you know, the plane had already boarded, everybody had loaded up, and she was just so ecstatic. She was like, Man, this 10 hour flight, I've got some room, the seats open, I'm gonna be able to lay down. And literally, at the last minute, some dude moves from some seat somewhere and just comes and sits down beside of her and she's like man there goes my room and if that's not bad enough about 10 minutes into the flight this is crazy you're not going to believe me you can ask her she just like the dude 10 minutes into the flight does this and just starts leaning and starts sleeping on her shoulder (laughs) can we talk about awkward and she's like doesn't know what to do she's like she's looking at me I'm like sorry I don't know what to tell you like I don't know this dude like But everybody loves a little room. It's why Lauren and I just had to buy a van because our family is growing and we needed a little bit more room. You know, you make room for what's important to you. That's why we bought a house. And for the last few years, we've just been making room, making more room. And there's a moment where Jesus asked Peter to make more room. And I just thought it was so cool, but we'll get to that in a second. So Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1, it says this, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. Now let's just stop right here and let's just see what Jesus' ministry was marked by. It was marked by crowds of people following him. And what I want you to see here is, do you think Jesus, the Savior of the world, put stipulations on who can be in the crowd? Do you think as he was like asking people to follow him, as the crowds grew bigger and bigger, that that he got nervous about that? And he got kind of ashamed, you know, worrying about what other people thought about that? And to the point where he would go around and be like, hey, uh, uh, do do you struggle with homosexuality? Or, or, Or have you had an abortion? Or, you know, like who, like where are you coming from? Like what's, what do you got going on in your life? Do you think Jesus put stipulations on the crowd hey are you high or uh, were you drunk last night because if you are I don't really want you in this crowd no that's not Jesus he just said hey come one come all I'm not worried about your behavior at this point I'm worried about your heart and if you'll just follow me for a while your heart will be transformed and then your behaviors will be transformed it's why I always say I don't care if you're drunk I don't care if you're high I don't care if you're divorced I don't care if you're homosexual I don't care if you're depressed I don't care who you you are or where you've come from you're welcome in this family and in this crowd there's not a litmus test here because Jesus would never do that now Jesus is going to speak to the crowd and he's going to tell them what they need to hear but he's going to welcome them in to the crowd and I would just say man like big crowds never intimidate Jesus 
But for some reason, it intimidated the Pharisees. They didn't like the big crowds that were following Jesus. They were uncomfortable with it because now, all of a sudden, the attention was not on the Pharisees. The attention was on Jesus. And religious people can't handle it when there's big crowds and they, 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 they don't have the attention. And they'll say things like, well, I just think this church is just too big. It's just too big for me. Like, I mean, when did it ever become a problem that people were coming to the church of Jesus Christ and filling chairs and seats and there were crowds of people coming to know Jesus more and crossing from death to life and taking next steps? When was that ever an issue for Jesus? It wasn't. Jesus was never concerned about his house being crowded. Now, I will say this. The mission of our church is not do whatever it takes to have a big church. It's do whatever it takes to make sure people don't go to hell. Amen? Amen. And we say it like this, so that lost people cross from death to life and continue taking steps to follow Jesus. But that's never a problem in the eyes of Jesus. You know, there's 7 billion people on planet Earth. Two billion say that they follow Jesus or that they believe in Jesus. That means there's five billion people on planet Earth who do not have a relationship with Jesus. And we're going to try to be like, oh, the church is too big. There's no room for you. No, we're going to make room in this house. As long as there's one person who needs to come to Jesus Christ, we'll make room. Amen? And so we make room for what's important to us. And then look at what Jesus did. This is pretty cool. It says, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. So he rolls up on Peter. What you need to know about Peter was he was a fisherman, not for entertainment, not for uh, recreation. He was a fisherman by trade. It was his livelihood. If he didn't catch anything, his family wasn't eating, right? Like if he didn't catch anything, he's not making any money today, okay? So he's a fisherman, not like you're a fisherman, okay? Because I don't think there's any pro fishermen in here who fish for money uh, or fish for their livelihood. But he was a fisher man who fished for his livelihood. Hood. Now, can I just be honest with you? And my dad's going to laugh at this because he knows I hate to fish. I hate it. It's awful. You just sit there and it stank on the boat. I can't, I can't, I, and every time I go, I never catch anything. You know, I, ne I never have caught anything. And then when I try to go like hook the worm or whatever, I always end up bleeding and I'm, just ne I'm the guy that's like, oh, there goes my bobber. Dang it. Oh, there goes my bobber. Again, right? Like I just, I never can catch, I can't get it in the boat. I'm the worst fisherman ever. And you're like, man, like, uh, you, you need to go fishing with me, and then you'll like fishing. No, I won't. <laughs> and I might end up hating you as well, okay? So <laughs> that's why I'm not going to go fishing with you. I just, I just can't do it. But I imagine what that was like for me, just as recreation, not being able to catch something. But Peter on this day, man, he couldn't catch anything. And he was frustrated. And so he kind of comes in from a night of fishing and hasn't caught anything. And Jesus says this to him right here. He says, he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to to Simon. So how many boats were there? There were two boats, and then he decided he was going to get in one of the boats. Anybody just grateful that Jesus is a, is a Savior who pursues you and will step into your world and get in your boat? How many people's boat is better because Jesus stepped into it? Man, I'm grateful that he stepped into my boat. Verse 3, it says, he got into one of the boats the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to, here it is, put out a little from the shore. In other words, what he's saying is, I want you to make some room. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Here's what Jesus did. He made some room. Jesus is teaching on the lake shore, and there are thousands of people. Can you imagine this? On the Sea of Galilee, like a beach, right? And then there's just thousands of people, and he can't speak to everybody. 
He, everybody can't hear him because there's so many people. And so what he does is he steps into Simon Peter's boat and he says, let's get out a little bit from the shore. Let's come out a little bit so that I can speak the gospel and more people can hear the gospel. I'm going to make a little room and you make room for what's important to you. Now you need to know that this was inconvenient for Peter, who had been fishing all night, hasn't caught anything. The only thing that was in his nets were beer cans and candy bar wrappers, right? Like, that's it. And he's tired. He's frustrated. He needs to get some sleep. And yet, here comes this Jesus guy stepping in his boat, saying, let's make some room where you kind of go out a little from the shore. Now, Peter is kind of putting his reputation on the line here. Because all these people are watching who is this crazy guy named Jesus? I mean, I'm amazed at his teaching, and it's unbelievable, but what's about to go down here? And I love that Peter just said, yes. You know, you could be one small yes away from your whole life changing. Just one small yes. It's why you need to grow your no so that God can bless your yes. Amen? Anybody in here just so busy? You just say yes to everything? Everything that comes your way, yes, yes. And then when God asks you to do something and to make a little room, you can't say yes. So maybe some of you need to grow your no so that God can bless your yes. Turn to your neighbor say, that's good. So he put out a little bit from shore and he made... Room. That's the first thing you need to do. If you want to be a difference maker, you've got to have some margin. You've got to make some room for God to work. Number two, you've got to take action. Come on, somebody. You've got to take action. You can't just hear a word from God. You know, when God speaks a word over us, from His perspective, we don't have it when we can repeat it. We have it when we do it. You've got to do something with the word that God spoke to you this week. The adjustment that he wanted to make in your life when he speaks to you, you don't have that word just because you can repeat it back to him. You have it when you take action and you actually do something about the word that he spoke. I love that people who are full of passion are full of action. In verse 4 it says this, when he, was, or when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. So in verse 3, Jesus asked him to make room and put out a little from the shore. Now Jesus is asking him to go deeper, to take a deeper step of faith. This is a principle for us because Jesus would never ask his followers to take a smaller step of faith. Because if it was a smaller step of faith, you wouldn't need faith. And so God says, hey, I need you to do this, and your obedience to that takes you to another level, and then he will take you deeper and deeper, and then that's when he does immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine as you say yes to him. Now, this is crazy because, again, they, they've been fishing all day. Peter's frustrated. The last thing on earth that Peter wants to do is to turn back around, go back out into the lake, and start fishing again. He just doesn't want to do it. He hasn't been out there. They've been in a drought, maybe. maybe, And they haven't caught anything. I mean, they were out there for, what, eight, ten hours, caught nothing. And now Jesus is like, nah, I want you to go. Let's go do this again. Put down your nets. It's inconvenient. He didn't want to do it. But I love what he says here. He kind of argues with him a little bit. And I told you last week, man, God's not in the business of arguing with you. Amen, like Clayton said, you argue with God, you lose. You try to win an argument with God, you still lose. Like there's no point in arguing because Jesus is always right. And he comes to him because Jesus is asking him to do this publicly. He's saying, I want you to go out and in front of all these thousands of people, I know you didn't catch anything all night, but I want you to fish in front of all these people. That's kind of intimidating. And here's what he says. Simon answered, Master, underline that word if you've got a Bible or he calls him Master. We'll come back to that. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Anything. Come on now, Jesus. We've worked all night. This doesn't make any sense why you're asking me to do this in front of all these people. Are you trying to embarrass me? Are you trying to like... Put me on the spot. Like, are you trying to prove a point with me? Because, like, I don't really get this, why this is going down. 
Oftentimes, you should write this down, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus is to say yes to Jesus even when you don't understand. To say yes to Jesus even when it's an inconvenience. Even when you don't want to. And Jesus, our Lord and Savior, demonstrated this in a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. You think Jesus wanted to go to the cross? You think Jesus wanted to be persecuted, spat upon, mocked? A spear put in his side, a crown of thorns crushed on his head. No, the night before he was crucified, he went to this place called the garden. He got on his knees, and he, there was so much pressure on him at the moment that he began to sweat drops of blood. Like, that's how badly he did not want to go through with this. But what did he say in the garden? He said, not my will, but your will be done. So Jesus would never ask you to do something that he wasn't willing to do first. He paved the way for us and did something that he didn't really, really want to do, but he did it because he loved you. And there are some things that God is asking you to do that Jesus will lead you to do in this life as you turn the pages of your life, and you're going to go, I don't understand that, God. And I don't, I don't, like, get it. But you don't have to understand everything to say yes to God. And Peter demonstrates this, and then he says this, quote. And it's just a, a quote that I live by. I said, man, this is what I want my life's phrase to be in response to God when he asked me to do something. This is so powerful right here. Man, I hope this gets inside of you. Even though he didn't want to go out there and lay down the nets again, even though he thought maybe this is going to be embarrassing, I don't quite get this. Even though this was an inconvenience, here's what he said. He says in verse 5, he says, but because you say so, I will. I don't want to do it, Jesus. I'll be honest with you. I don't understand what you're doing right now. I think this is a joke right now. But because you say so, I will. B-Y-S-S-I-W. B-Y-S-S-I-W. Because you say so, I will. What if that was your response to everything, everything that God asked you to do? He calls you to fast and you said, okay, because you say so, I will. I don't really feel like it, but if you're calling me and leading me to fast, if you're calling me to step aside, if you're calling me to stay in a relationship or go from a job or whatever you ask me to do, God, because you say so, I will. See, you don't have to understand completely to obey immediately. And obedience, man, is unbelievable. We look at Peter, and he's one of the top three Christians to ever walk the planet Earth. But in that moment, this is where Peter's journey started. I love what Jesus didn't do was say, hey, I need you to let your nets down. And what's going to happen is you're going to let your nets down. A lot of fish are going to kind of come in. And then I'm going to call you to be a fisher of men. I'm going to ask you to follow me. And you're going to leave your family. And you're going to kind of do this. And you're going to follow me for three years. And it's going to be awesome. But then you're going to have a setback where you deny me three times. And then you're going to have this one time where they're going to come arrest me. And you're going to chop off this ear. And I'm going to have to put the ear back on. And then, like, you know, you're going to have this time where you deny me three times. And then, uh, you know, you're going to kind of question everything. It's going to be a little bit of a setback, but then I'm going to come up here to you, and I'm going to restore you, and when I restore you, you're going to be at a new level that you never thought, I mean, you're going to be, it's going to be immeasurably more, and then one day after I ascend into heaven, you're going to preach, and 3,000 people are going to be saved, and it's going to be awesome, then you're going to go to Rome, and then 2,000 years later, man, this gospel is going to be widespread, and there's going to be this church called Rescue House Church that talks about who you are and what you've done, and it all comes down to whether you say yes or not to these nets. Like, that's not how Jesus operates. That's not how Jesus operates. He just wants to know, are you going to be faithful in the small? Peter, will you just let down your nets? That's where it starts. And everybody's got to start somewhere. And if you'll say yes to the small, if you'll be faithful to the small, God will just continue to take you to new levels. And you can make a difference like this ordinary Peter guy with not a real bright education, really obviously wasn't that great at fishing, who made a lot of mistakes, who fell on his face, but yet God saw potential 
And he said, even the ordinary can make a difference. Anybody just grateful that he sees something special in the ordinary? <laughs> something special in us, man. He sees potential in us. And this is what God is calling you to today. Your response, because you say so, I will. He's setting something up for you. So the first thing is to make room. Second thing is to take action. You got to do something. You got to say yes, and then you got to go do it. And then the third thing is recognition. Recognition. Have you ever just kind of got down and started praying without kind of thinking about it? And you forget who you're praying to? I mean, I have. I'll be honest with you. There's sometimes I get down and I begin to talk and I don't recognize who it is that I'm talking to. And I've got to get a perspective, man, that who I'm talking to is a grave robbing, water walking, miracle working, coming back Jesus. That's who I'm talking to when I begin to speak to him. And Peter had a recognition issue. We see that. I believe in verse 5, he called him master. But I want you to look and see what he, he called him later on. Verse 6, he says, When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Can we just all agree that Jesus wants more for Peter's life than Peter wants for his life? And if that's true for Peter, it's true for you today. And it all starts with a moment. Verse 7, it says, They signaled their partners in the other boat, remember there was two boats, to come and help him, help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Can I just declare this? Because I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure this is an accurate statement. This has never happened in the history of fishing in the world. Where two boats became so full of fish that both boats began to sink. I, I'm, or sink. I've never heard of it. Never heard of it. This is the miracle of God. And then when this happens, Peter sees something he's never seen before. Because when you say yes to God, you just say yes to what's before you. You're not, oh, you know, looking so far to the future that you can't say yes in the moment. Here, check out what Peter says. Verse 8. It says, When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me. And what does he call him now? Lord. In verse 5, he called him Master. In verse 8, he calls him Lord. Woo! Because Master is a sign of respect. But Lord is a sign of worship. And in a moment, when he saw those fish, when he saw those boats sinking, he knew without a shadow of a doubt, this isn't a master. This is my Lord. I just wonder, have you seen Jesus do some things in your life? that maybe nobody else even knows about. You see how far he's brought you, and you look back and you know without a shadow of a doubt, he is Lord. He is Lord. How can we say no to that? I just want to say to you, you better recognize. <laughs> you got to recognize who Jesus is, what he's done, how far he's brought you. You've got to grow your no to the world so you can give your yes to God. And he can bless that yes. I'll never forget when I started this church. and I can't tell you how many people counted me out. I can't tell you how many people looked at me and said, you have an afro, you wear a hoodie, you're 25 years old, you don't have any life experiences, you've never preached a sermon, You've never led anything. And they looked at me, and like, I'm not kidding. This is my story. They looked me in the eye, and they said, this is going to fail. Oh, and by the way, a church like this will never work in Moxville. And I have more people, have more people against me than that supported me. I think I have my parents. I think I have my brother. 
outside of that, I, before we ever launched or started, man, like, all I had was Jesus. I don't know if you've ever been in that place where you just, all you had was him. And you didn't understand, because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I was just a kid. And God put a dream on my heart to pastor people, to lead a church. And I just look back over those moments ago, and I, I don't understand, God. I don't know what I'm getting myself into. I don't know how this is all going to work. But because you say so, I'll plant this house and I'll do what I can. But I'm going to need your help. And he's been with me every, every step of the way. Amen. And it's the greatest honor of my life. But it started in a classroom at Lipscomb University in the middle of getting my master's, which everybody told you that's what you need to have. You got to have the best education. And God told me in the middle of getting my master's for free, you're going to return home and you're going to start this church. And I just wonder, what if I had said no? And I want you to know it's not about me at all. I just want you to know that God wants to do immeasurably more in your life. And there's somebody in here who it's been on your heart to step out and do something that's uncomfortable and inconvenient. And for some reason, you just, maybe it's that you're not saying no, you're just not moving at all. And you're just hoping that it goes away and it's not going to go away until your response to God is because you say so, I will. B-Y-S-S-I-W. Would that be your response, your life's response to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords from this point forward? B-Y-S-S-I-W. Because you say so. Even though I don't understand, even though it's inconvenient, I will. Amen, church? Amen. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for what you're doing in our house. And God, I just um, thank you for this word. And I just pray, God, for the person who needs to say yes to you in this moment. God, whatever you're calling them to do, whatever you're asking them to do, if it's to leave a job, if it's to stay at a job, if it's to start something or stop something, if it's to step out on faith in an area, God, I pray that their response would be, because you say so, I will. God, I pray that we're that type of church as well, that we're that type of family, that we'll act in audacious faith, even if we don't quite get it. And God, I thank you for our house. I thank you for our family. I thank you for this revival. God, I pray that it has just brought not a temporary fire to us, but an eternal fire for who you are and what you want to do in our hearts and in our lives. So we give you this day. We give you this message. I pray that we would take action, that this would not be a message we repeat, but a message that we go and live out, and that our response would be, because you say so, I will. We love you, Jesus, and it's in Christ's name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Come on, clap your hands if you're grateful you made it to the house this morning.